Hello everyone, welcome to the episode 46 of Solid Saturday. The guest we have today, Veen Vasishta. He is a Chief Data Scientist at Data by V Square and CEO at V Square. As well as he is the editor at the ML Rebellion. So let's hear more about his career journey. How did he find his area of interest in the data field and managing to lead that area? So welcome, Vin. Uh, very happy to have you on the show. Hope I pronounced the name right. <laughs> yes. Thanks for having me. Yep. Um, so moving towards our first question, uh, which is more over like, you know, when I came across your profile, it is completely like a unique path towards the data field. So how did you find your passion for the field and were you passionate about your previous roles too? I uh, went to college for mm-hmm. machine learning. I found uh, Microsoft gave the University of Nevada Reno a grant to do a little bit of machine learning research and a little bit of machine learning teaching. And so that's where I discovered it. Second year in college, fell in love with it, thought I was going to graduate, get a job at Microsoft doing artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. No, in the 90s, nobody wanted anyone to do artificial intelligence. So it kind of fell off a cliff. And what I was passionate about, I had to put on a shelf. For a so I stuck with. Uh, Anything that was technical. I started out running a business where I was basically a technician. Mm-hmm. Uh, installed networks, servers, PCs, uh, built mm-hmm. websites, uh, did some SQL Server and some app development. Mm-hmm. And then I, that business didn't do so well. And so I went into the corporate world for a while. And I learned a lot from that. I learned mm-hmm. about how businesses operate. Mm-hmm. And although I've always been passionate about technology, I've loved what I really love what I've done, uh, mm-hmm. all the way from installing computers to product management, everything in between, leading teams, building teams. All of those have been fun, but I really love the machine learning field. This is this is really what I'm passionate about, and I try to bring passion to everything I've done in the past, mm-hmm. and I think I've been successful. In it. Like I said, I've enjoyed a lot of the work that I've done, just broadly. And I think it's been really important to my machine learning career because I understand every phase of the software development life cycle. I've talked to customers. I've had customers complain mm-hmm. to me about what doesn't work in an application, what mm-hmm. they needed to have happen. I've worked hand in hand with customers where I've sat, uh, actually sat on a manufacturing floor and had a customer just walk me through, this is what I need, what you're building to do. And I was able to just sit there and build the specification on the fly. And a lot of those types of experiences aren't typical for people who are in the machine learning field. Mm-hmm. And so being business-centric, being user-centric it, with CEOs and with the C-suite, and I've understood from the inside and outside mm-hmm. that there, this has to make money. If it doesn't make money, there's no point to it, and it's hard to get budget. And there's all of these other things happening in the background that tie into the business. And I got to see a lot of those. So I've had a strange path, and I've loved all of it. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, I've been in machine learning now for these, well, data science, analytics, machine learning for about eight, nine years. It's been a lot of fun. I think this is the most fun I've had. Uh, going from development, primarily machine learning and data science development, to kind of a combination of strategy consulting mm-hmm. and product development, uh, machine learning product development, and now. I've come back to sort of more of a product development focus, building some products for the company uh, that I just founded. And I still have the consulting practice with Square. So like I said, I'm still in both worlds and I really like that. I think that's really my passion. Yeah, that's great. And it shows in your work as well that you're how much passionate you are about this field. And I would like to congratulate you actually being one of the data science influencers. Thank Uh, you. That shows actually that you are really doing great in the area you are passionate about. So, um, have you ever lost your passion? How did you get back to it? Like a couple of things you mentioned back and forth, like, you know, uh, you were back into the corporate world and again came back to your passion and started your own thing. But have you ever lost in your passion and how did you get back, manage to get back? There have been different points in my career where I've I've lost the fire. Uh, that was something someone said to me really early on in my career is that I had to be careful not to lose my fire. Uh-huh. And I get what they meant by that. Now, there have been stages where what I'm doing feels 
I don't know, repetitive, stagnant. Mm-hmm. Feels like I'm not doing what I should be doing or mm-hmm. not using my talents well enough. Um, mm-hmm. I've gotten frustrated with companies before because I don't think that they were doing the right thing. I felt like they should listen to me mm-hmm. and I should be the CEO. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's easy to lose your passion. And, and I've lost mine mm-hmm. when what I was doing and what the business was doing didn't line up. It really didn't make a lot of sense for me to be there. And I've started to learn that if if what I'm doing doesn't line up with a client, doesn't line up with a customer, mm-hmm. doesn't line up with the company that I'm working with, I'm going to lose interest. And that's really loss of passion. Mm-hmm. And I think at the times that I've been most passionate, I've been growing and learning. And anytime I stop doing that, anytime I start looking for reasons that I'm right about something versus learning, growing, being wrong, not being afraid of failure. When I get to that other side, I I realize Mm -hmm. I'm losing my passion. I've got to get back to learning. I've got to get back to Mm -hmm. listening to people. I've got to get back to building things that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how I've gone back and forth. And I'm still kind of catching myself from time to time, even recently. Well, losing my passion for something that, that, and having to really bring myself back into more of a growth mindset and get out of that mm-hmm. sort of rut. Yeah, but I think everybody's had. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, that's true. And as you mentioned, actually, even though it was a failure, you mentioned that you were always ready to like, you know, get back, learn new things and uh, listen more. So that shows actually courage to handle the failure. It is one of the ways, I guess, um, to handle the failures. So even mm-hmm. though you say that you are scared of failures, you always prepared actually. Even though failure happened, uh, you can get back to you actually, you know, uh, achieve what you want. So thank you so much for sharing. And moving towards our next question is about, you know, we are coming back to your failure, which is one of the failure in your corporate world that you have been laid off. And mm-hmm. talking about little ab- little more about that, how can someone land on their feet and keep moving their professional life forward? I want to say first, and I don't hate companies. I, I, I think companies are, for the most part, uh, you know, filled with people that want to make money, that want to do well for people that work for them, mm-hmm. shareholders, customers, that sort of thing. But companies at a certain point sort of lose their way. And, and I alluded to that a little earlier where mm-hmm. what I was doing and what the company was doing sort of lost alignment. Mm-hmm. And there are companies who are profitable who will lay people off. And I was, in 2012, I was in a company that was profitable mm-hmm. and that was laying people off. They were trying to make themselves more attractive to a buyer, somebody that was going to come in and buy the company out, which mm-hmm. they were successful in. But they were a profitable company. And, you know, when they laid me off, it was one of those, okay, so it must be me. You know, if the company's making money and they got rid of me, you know, obviously I am the problem. They eliminated the entire team. Uh, mm-hmm. You know my entire team that I was uh, I was leading working with. It, it's one of those things that took me a while to get my head around uh, understanding from the strategy side. Mm-hmm. The reason why they, they laid me off is because they were trying to make themselves more attractive for a sale to someone else. Mm-hmm. And so that's the first piece of recovery is understanding companies just do that. This is how companies work. They will lay you off. It's ruthless. Mm-hmm. And those are the type of companies that you want to avoid working for because at any time you could be laid off. They can be making tons of money. Your group could be doing very, very well for them. And they could just decide, well, you're, you're profitable, but not the most profitable. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to take resources away from you and put them someplace else. And that's why I say, you know, one of the things you can do to prepare yourself for a layoff is not work for companies that do that. If they don't understand how to transition people. Yeah off of projects onto more profitable projects that they don't want to develop their people internally shouldn't work for. Mm -hmm. So a lot of landing on your feet is not putting yourself in the position of working with a company that will do that to you. But the second part is really believing in yourself once it's all over. Mm -hmm. Get up, leave, you know, spend a few days or whatever it takes you to come back from sort of the the gut punch of somebody telling you get out. Mm -hmm. That's, that's hard. It's it's an in your face failure. So take the time, get back to self confidence. Take a little bit of self care. You know, if that's a couple of days where you just read a book on the couch or watch some TV, whatever it takes to really get yourself back in the mindset, and then start learning. Mm-hmm. Start talking to people. 
and don't take the first job that comes your way. A lot of times mm -hmm. the first job is, well, I could take it, mm -hmm. but really you should be asking yourself, should you be taking it? Mm -hmm. Is this the right thing for you rather than something that's just right in front of you? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times taking another week, will end up finding a better role, something mm -hmm. that's a better fit for you. And once you're laid off, it's also a great time to transition into a new role or into a different field. Yeah. Oftentimes, you'll find out that what you were doing mm -hmm. translates really well into something else, and a layoff can turn into a promotion. Mm -hmm. And in my case, I started a business. I, I I really advise if you get laid off, start a business. In most states in the U.S., you can just get a business license for not a lot of money. And even if it doesn't turn into anything, you know, even if you take a corporate job, you still have that business. You have the ability to consult on the side, do a little mm -hmm. bit of work on the side. And it may turn into an actual business one yeah. day. Just having it is sort of one of those things that can be a positive that comes out of a layoff. Because mm -hmm. now you're thinking, well, I could start my own thing. Well, instead of working for somebody else and building value for someone else, maybe I want to build value for myself. Mm. It can be the beginning of a business, even though it seems like the worst time to start one. Mm -hmm. It could be the best one. Yeah. And it all comes back to, I think, your positive thinking as well. So I'm very sure that your know, audience is going to like it, uh, the conversation we are having, because uh, you are truly inspiring or the motivational for them who are like, you know, uh, lack that positivity or take their failures or the, you know, uh, Laying off is something that nowadays also happening with a lot of employees actually yes. because of the pandemic. So it is very unfortunate sometimes. It is not like completely in your hands when you're working for other organizations. So uh, definitely uh, finding out the new opportunity out of it is the better approach and being positive always and working on your own skills. So thank you so much for sharing. Moving towards our next question is about, you know, uh, would you like to talk a little more about what you are doing and building right now? I'm working on decision support. Mm -hmm. That was, I've realized that every machine learning problem is a decision support problem. And that for me was sort of a couple of years ago, I realized that it was transformational in the way that I've dealt with machine learning problems mm -hmm. from there until now. I was trying to figure out why some companies would adopt machine learning and be successful with it. Mm -hmm. While other companies with just as talented people and just as much revenue sort of being planned mm -hmm. and riding on machine learning just wouldn't do what was necessary to adopt the technology or to be successful with getting products to market. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, they just abandoned it. They said, ah, we can just say it's machine learning, mm -hmm. you know, and we'll put a little bit of analytics on a dashboard and we'll call it good. And I was trying to figure out why that would happen. Why would two companies that could be equally successful, one would succeed, the other one would fail? I spent a lot of time researching that. I, I actually started looking at this problem when Circuit City went out of business. And this was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. and it was 2005 or six. I can't remember the exact year. Mm -hmm. But Best Buy essentially put Circuit City out of business. And I, that was when I started wondering, why do some businesses succeed and other ones fail? Because they were doing the same thing. How does one just steamroller the other one? And that started me down this really long path Mm -hmm. that a couple of years ago, it sort of clicked. And that's what I'm working on when it comes to decision support, is understanding mm -hmm. how people make decisions mm -hmm. and how you can improve those decisions. I talk to a lot of decision scientists, a lot of people who actually do research in this mm -hmm. field. Uh, they all, for the most part, agree that it's environmental. And I have a hard time with there, there is one data set that I got access to that mm -hmm. predicts a lot of details about a person based on everything from zip code to buying activities. And it mm -hmm. said I was retired in place. It, that was what it classified me as, is aging in place, retired in place. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, what? that's not possible. But then I looked at the decisions and realized, okay, yeah, I can kind of see it. It predicted how much I weighed. I mean, just from my zip code, so this is what you weigh. And talking to, to decision scientists, they say mm -hmm. that, well, that's a product of your environment. You're really not making a whole lot of decisions. You're just a product of your environment. So I started doing my own research. I started looking at it from a machine learning standpoint. Mm -hmm. 
And there's two components to decision support that I'm working on. One is giving data at the right time to make decisions, Mm -hmm. improving the types of data that are provided, and then providing a feedback loop, an outcome loop, and giving it a score. And it starts out really simple because it's just a dashboard. But the math underneath helping a person Mm -hmm. get the right data at the right time Having the system be smart enough to know when it should be giving a person data and when it shouldn't, when it should just shut up. Because sometimes machine learning systems overstep and they're not capability aware. They'll make a recommendation or a prescription. Mm-hmm. And it's in, a, it's in a piece of the system that they're not very good at describing. And so in many cases, a machine learning algorithm will overstep. Just mm-hmm. because it works through a few decision chains doesn't mean it works through all of them. And like I said, it starts off as a very, very simple thing of just providing data on a dashboard. And that hides a significant amount of complexity when it comes to math that has to sort of drive these models that not only are predicting and prescribing what to do next, but also figuring out how to work with the individual Mm -hmm. and understanding its own. The model is understanding the model's capability. So there is an entire separate model that looks at Mm -hmm. Each one of the pieces of data that's being provided looks at the decision outcome and says, at this point in the decision chain, I'm actually not that good at this. And so I need to back off a little bit until I learn more and become more accurate with accuracy being measured by things like decision outcomes. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm working on. I talk about passion. I love this. This has been fun. And we're releasing some products through uh, Data by V-Squared, hopefully in March next year. Oh, wow. That'll be the first ones just in the space of what I'm working on. Mm-hmm. I encourage if you're if you're going into data science and machine learning, mm-hmm. incomplete information games, decision science, decision support, machine learning based decision mm-hmm. support, very very interesting. Might be worth taking a look at. Mm-hmm. And then uh, when you are talking about the decision decision scientist role, right? Uh, how do you differentiate that from the data scientist role, or is it just uh, like a term difference? Oh, no, the decision scientist is the research, and Mm -hmm. they are really in a completely different field. Mm -hmm. And a decision scientist often can be a a role in psychology. Mm -hmm. That is somebody who's got a PhD and who doesn't do data science at all. They do something completely different from a research standpoint. Mm -hmm. And what I'm doing is sort of piggybacking on a lot of their research and a lot of what they've been working on. And in some cases, contradicting. I think the difference between their definition of environmental and my definition of environmental is I think data and feedback, Mm -hmm. data and feedback loops Mm -hmm. define your environment, Mm -hmm. whether you stay in the same place, stay in the same company, Mm -hmm. stay with the same group of friends. If you have new feedback loops and new information, your behaviors change. And so I'm approaching this from the data side, really bringing uh, machine learning to bear on helping making people make better decisions. Mm-hmm. The decision scientist comes at it from the other side where they're researching how people make decisions. They're doing experiments mm-hmm. to sort of discover how the mind works and how we make decisions both as in, as individuals and as groups. Mm-hmm. So uh, is it moreover going to be like when we think about like, you know, if we have to generalize this decision scientist role, as you mentioned, it is more over like a research, uh, as well as is it more over towards like uh, monetizing the uh, data model or like? Um, monetization really isn't, uh, they're more of an academic role. Mm-hmm. And so even though you find them in companies, like especially larger companies, larger tech companies like Google, mm-hmm. they have a, a good uh, good set of data science, decision mm-hmm. scientists in there. But I don't want to confuse that role with data yeah. science or machine learning or any of that. They, those researchers may use uh-huh. those tools, but they're not specifically focused on them. So it's completely different, really. Yeah. I heard the story behind, you know, how this data scientist uh, term came into the picture uh, from mm-hmm. uh, the uh, chief data scientist who, are the, who were the former chief data scientist, actually, uh, DJ Patil. Mm-hmm. He shared the story, how that term came out and why they used the term data scientist before uh so that's why i was like you know nowadays people more talk about the decision scientist when they both are kind of interlinked Mm -hmm. but moreover like decision scientist i feel makes more sense when we think more about you know uh finding the data insights rather than just being the data scientist but both are like i guess goes hand in hand kind of 
A lot of research roles do. Yes. Yeah, that's a huge point. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. And moving towards one more important question is like, you know, from 2012 to now, uh, you are being in this field for a long time. So what changes do you see in this field and what has been improved and has anything gotten worse that you see? I think we're out of the research phase. And that's really important. Mm -hmm. We spent a lot of 2012 to 2016 in the research phase. It, we had a lot of products that came to market uh, but a lot of products that came to market with the data science and machine learning label, uh, it's not what was going on in the hood. It was analytics, even using machine learning algorithms. A lot of times all they ended up with was analytics. And so it mm -hmm. got the sticker put on it, but it wasn't really data science and machine learning. It was, it was mm -hmm. more research, big R, little development. Mm -hmm. So when you say research and development, you can have big R, which is mostly research, and then it has a little bit of impact on the product. Or you can have smaller, smaller research phase and then a bigger development cycle, more mm -hmm. impactful, larger, more complex products. And I think that's where we are now is we've moved past the research phases and we're now into a larger development. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is the research is coming back. Yep. I'm mm -hmm. seeing the cycle sort of repeat itself where we need optimization. A lot mm -hmm. of companies are realizing that the amount of money it takes to train to test, to iterate consistently. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you try 20 or 30 approaches mm -hmm. and you can have twice that number of training cycles mm -hmm. to figure out what's the right data. You know, should I add a few points, move a few points? What model is the most effective? Okay, now I have to customize that model. Mm -hmm. Which pieces am I customizing each time you're retraining? Sometimes a portion, sometimes the whole thing. Now you're integrating with multiple models. Those models are now integrating into production. It's this huge complexity. And a lot of what slows down development is, number one, the complexity of integration. Mm -hmm. It takes these massive teams because it's not only a machine learning team. Now it's all the other teams that have to take the model and somehow fit it into the actual product that's going to go to the customer's hands or the, the business's hands. And that's a, that's a different shift in the the research now is really focused in one direction in optimization, making that process faster and cheaper. And mm -hmm. so you're seeing a whole lot of, I mean, Google's, all of a sudden Google's sort of chip business makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you would ask, well, why would Google make their own chips? Now you're seeing more and more companies making yeah. their own chips for machine mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. so oh, I get it. It's because it costs a whole lot of money Yes. Even if there's a little mm -hmm. bit of loss mm -hmm. in the processing power. And so it's worth the investment. You can see this one research, kind of this big R that's coming back into optimization and mm -hmm. basically speeding up everything. Mm -hmm. And then your other research is, and I'm kind of following this trailing behind this sort of research and saying, okay, we don't, we don't do causal inference. Mm -hmm. We do a whole lot of uh, correlation, big, massive data sets, very, very complicated models. Mm -hmm. We're not really sure which features and what data we really needed until we get done and then go back and do this really complicated evaluation cycle. And the focus there is just on, does the model work? Mm -hmm. Whereas now we're doing a lot of research into, well, let's understand the system under measurement. Let's begin to tackle the concept of complex systems and causal relationships. Why do things happen mm -hmm. rather than being able to predict it simply because you've seen it a hundred times? You know, why, why does this car hit someone? Yeah. Not how do I avoid hitting something or, you know, mm -hmm. the number of things that you see in autonomous driving mm -hmm. moving away from well, all of these features this one time resulted in this, therefore mm -hmm. I learned. Now we're moving more towards understanding that's a road, those lines are things that you need to stay in between. And if you lose those lines, now what do you do? And so there's this sort of understanding the reason why you stay in lines is not to hit anything, mm -hmm. not to hit a barrier. And so this is causality. And so if lines disappeared, what would you do? Well, you try to avoid hitting things. You want to stay on the road and don't hit anything. And that's a causal because now you understand the purpose mm. of parts of your driving. So it's a causal inference. And it's a, 
it's sort of the research area that I see us going in the direction of, and that spawns a whole lot of smaller research. And so I, I think the biggest changes are we went from a research cycle to an applied, very, very strong applied cycle since about 2016 up and mm-hmm. still through today where we have a strong applied cycle. And now we're starting to circle back to a research cycle because we're understanding mm-hmm. what it takes to productize, what it takes to build value. Mm-hmm. And we're getting to shift into the direction of more focused research. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. And I'm really enjoying talking to you, uh, listening to you actually more. And the way you are talking definitely shows that you are truly leading your passion. So uh, what is your leadership in this spirit and what is your leadership style as well as how someone can form a technical role into a leadership role, like transform themselves from technical to the leadership role? There's a lot of confusion in the technical world. In all technical fields Uh the the confusion between technical leadership Uh and leadership there's two completely different areas just because you are technically a leader Uh someone who is consistently teaching new Uh and even mid-level sometimes very senior level you have uh, people who are what are the principals um distinguished staff level Uh you hear some job titles thrown around there where they're very very senior technical And so they teach, they guide, they create architecture, they do very complex projects, sometimes research. Mm -hmm. And the mistake that often gets made is people promote them. And they don't want to lead. Mm -hmm. They they don't know how to lead. (laughs) They're just technically very, very smart. Mm -hmm. And people follow them because they respect them. However, they're not leaders. That's the transition that needs to be made is, why should someone follow you? Mm-hmm. And that's the question I've consistently tried to ask to build a leadership style. Why should anyone follow me? What's mm-hmm. the point? And again, that comes back to alignment. If I align the business goals with the team's goals, mm-hmm. with individual goals, I don't have to lead anything. That ju- it just happens. Yeah. That's leadership. That really is. It's lining everything up mm-hmm. and preventing those things that are outside of someone's day-to-day life or day-to-day work from creeping into the team. That's the Mm -hmm. whole point of a leader is to say, this is what we're focused on. This is what we're doing. If anyone tries to come in from the outside or any sort of tasks sort of creep Mm -hmm. in from the inside that don't line up with your individual goals as a team member, with the team's goals Mm -hmm. or with the business goals, those that's confusion. We need to keep that out where we need to realize that something has to change in one of those three areas in order to accommodate. Sometimes it's a reality change is it's always happening. And mm-hmm. so in some cases, when that comes up, another leader needs to deal with that. What does that mean? How mm-hmm. does that create change? And can I, is this something I as a leader need to resolve, have the authority to resolve and have mm-hmm. the capability and the resources to resolve? Or is this something I need to escalate? Is this something I need to communicate to someone above me? And all of these things are leadership. Mm -hmm. So leadership gets a very large misunderstood uh, stamp on it. And Mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, leaders are just data scientists and machine learning scientists and researchers who have the title and just do their everyday job without the title. And every Mm -hmm. once in a while, they have to go to a meeting. And that's not a leader. If you don't have true leadership, Mm -hmm. teams get off the rails, projects go off the rails, communication gets lost. Teams get stuck in sort of a no man's land because no one wants to talk to you. Uh Uh, It's There's a lot that goes along with leadership, Uh but I think that's the simplest way to sum it up. And it doesn't have a lot to do with being the most technical person on the team. In Uh fact, in a lot of cases, it has to do with understanding who is and just getting out of their way. Uh Leaders sometimes want to say, no, but I'm also the smartest. And it's a whole lot simpler to just say, let's pretend I'm the dumbest person in the room. Now, you all teach me mm-hmm. and ask some questions. And a lot of times that's what leadership is, is just being quiet, getting out of the way, mm-hmm. and knowing when it's time to put your hand on the steering wheel a little bit and say, what about this? Mm. What, what if, What if? you know, can I ask you something about why you use this data right here? It doesn't seem like these two sources really work well together because they don't agree at all. Why did you know just that one question? That's leadership. Yep. And sometimes it doesn't take the most technical person in some cases to just take a different perspective 
and come at a problem differently. I mean, that's in a lot of cases leadership. Mm-hmm. It, it misunderstood. Yeah, that is true actually, and uh, I think it is like little underrated as well uh, because people are more or into you know uh, avoid getting into the spotlight because something mm-hmm. happens, then leader is more responsible to answer that question. That's why people prefer to prefer being in that their safer zone and being on the technology side, like you know do their work. like a sign task and go back home kind of so thank you so much for sharing and moving towards one more important question towards like you know our tips and advice uh, how do students break into this field and what career paths are available what are the jobs of the future in this field i think the first thing you do is network mm-hmm. and start in high school you know especially mm-hmm. now start in high school get to know people who are ceos yeah. at large companies Mm-hmm. Don't be afraid to reach out to the CEO of Microsoft. Yep. Why not? What is he going to do? Ignore you? You're 16. <laughs> How would that go over? You know, and these are the types of things that you realize that as a young person you have an advantage. Mm-hmm. In that we as people in the field who are, you know, I'm sort of a mid-level person, there's people that are are running large companies. We have this obligation to teach, to give back. to start opening doors for people in the field. So first thing you do is just start network. Get mm-hmm. to know people, create meaningful relationships. Mm-hmm. Don't just send an email and say please, you know, send me a connection. Please connect. Yeah. Who cares? Be an active follower. Mm-hmm. And read, engage, comment, ask questions. Sort of get to know the person and create opportunities to engage with people who can teach you. Mm-hmm. That is your path into the field. And it, It's, it, a lot of people think it's education. A lot of people think it's resume. A lot of people, the most effective way to get a job is to network. And the sooner you start in your career to become a good networker, to mm-hmm. become really proficient at building relationships with people mm-hmm. who are at a very senior level, mm-hmm. whether it's technical or leadership, the better you get at that, mm-hmm. the longer your career is going to be, and the more successful it's going to be. So breaking into the field. has just as much to do with networking and learning from mentors mm-hmm. as it does with where you go to college what internship you land mm-hmm. these things are important but not as important as coming into the field with sort of this team two or three really good mentors and sort of targeting teams that you want to work with that you think you could learn from Mm-hmm. Those are some of the most important things that you can do to break into the field. Mm-hmm. On the other side of that, you're going to have to go through an interview process. And the people that run the interviews don't know how to hire. Mm-hmm. They really don't understand the process. This is another thing, you know, the myth of leadership just because you're technical, therefore you could be a leader of the team. It's the same thing just because you're technical doesn't mean you can hire people. So judging talent is different than selecting an algorithm. It's different than training, than coding. It's it's different than all of that. Mm-hmm. And so, in many cases, you're going to go into an interview room with people who do not understand how to judge your talent. Mm-hmm. And this is another reason why you go back to networking, because the longer of a relationship you've had with a person, the mm-hmm. more likely it is that when they come into the interview with you, mm-hmm. they already know you, at least in a certain respect. They know you. They understand what your talents and what your capabilities are. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the questions are going to be more focused on trying to hire you mm-hmm. versus trying to get you out the door. And again, this is where relationships become important because you have more focused interviews. Mm-hmm. You've also been building your career in a direction that's a lot more focused. You're building your career towards a particular team or a set of teams that you want to work for. Mm-hmm. And so you know what projects they work. On. You know what technology stack they work with. And you have a whole lot more focus learning. a whole lot more focused uh, sort of uh you know career path is not the right word but you get what i'm saying a whole lot more focused direction in your attempts to get into the field if you know where you're going to land or at least have an idea of what a team that you want to work with looks like mm-hmm. new roles in the field the data science product product manager the data science project manager mm-hmm. you're going to see a data science quality assurance role come mm-hmm. up very very soon it's going to be a combination of so your data governance mm-hmm. side of the house mm-hmm. when it comes to understanding data quality maintaining data quality with analysts mm-hmm. making sure the pipeline itself continues to flow and 
there's a quality assurance component to that. Mm-hmm. There's also a quality assurance component to model validation mm-hmm. and integration where your machine learning engineers and your machine learning architects, which mm-hmm. I think those are fairly well understood roles. Those are, those are sort of the two years ago's futuristic role, but the, once they're done with the integration, there mm-hmm. is a testing component to mm-hmm. make sure that the model still functions and it also functions as integrated with an existing product or a new product. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of complexity there. So I see, you know, the data science quality assurance, data science product manager, because again, back to monetization, it's got to make money. Mm-hmm. It, it has to align with a product roadmap. It has to be something that that individual understands machine learning well enough to communicate Mm -hmm. with the team and understand the solution, but also be able to communicate to senior leadership and other teams and to work with the project manager who's in many ways the same, same sort of skill set, but less strategic, Mm -hmm. more on the relationships and Mm -hmm. on sort of the program project management, more traditional skills in that direction. But again, mm-hmm. understanding what each one of those deliverables are, because machine learning deliverables are completely different, very, very complex. You know, understanding that I might iterate through four different types of, of activation function or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, you if you're a project manager who has no idea what machine learning is, and you see that on yeah. a project <laughs> plan, you're thinking, uh-huh. you know, or if you do agile and you see that as, you know, and you, what? What does that mean? How do you even estimate that? <laughs> That's you know, so it takes someone who has an understanding of the technology mm-hmm. as well as your more traditional uh, project management or product management roles. And so look at those types of roles. They're, they are going to last longer than machine learning scientists as well. Thank you so much for sharing actually. And it was really very wise for the students as well who are trying to get into this field or trying to grow uh, in a particular direction because you almost touched all the areas, I guess, uh, in the ML and the AI side. So thank you so much. Uh, Moving towards the end of this uh, show, uh, the last question that I would like to ask is like, you know, how do you start a business and what do you have to do go from employee to business owner or founder? I think the most important piece of advice for starting a business that I've ever gotten mm-hmm. is it's not enough to just hang up your shingle. And I don't know if that analogy is a little old because the person that gave it to me is mm-hmm. probably in his seventies now. <laughs> so he was oh. been around a lot longer than I have. Uh-huh. And it used to be, you would just put up a shingle, which had your name and what you did in front of your company, uh-huh. which was, you know, that was how you advertised you had a shingle. And you said, hey, look, I do this, and customers would see you and they'd show up. That's mm-hmm. not how it works. It's not enough to just tell people I do something and expect customers to show up. And so before before you sort of make your livelihood, your business, mm-hmm. start your business anytime you want to. Like I said, businesses are cheap for stuff. You can mm-hmm. get a business license, you are a business owner. Congratulations. But now you have to be profitable. Now you have to create products or services mm-hmm. you have to get customers and all of this is way more complicated than you think <laughs> and so before you make the business your livelihood before you leave uh-huh. your day job have customers have people who are willing to buy whatever it is that you're selling a lot of startups make a product and assume that it's going to get funding you know it doesn't have to be profitable i just have to convince a vc uh-huh. To give me money, I'm going to create this great team of people with great backgrounds, and we're going to pitch, you know, some of the biggest VCs, and, and we're going to get this money, and then they don't know what's going to happen after that. And VCs don't, you know, they see right through that. So have a, have customers, have a product uh-huh. that customers actually want that somebody's bought, have revenue, and then you start to understand a whole lot about business uh-huh. and frequently you start saying, okay, I can't do this alone. I need, and you begin to understand the role of somebody who's better at, at marketing or sales. You begin to understand the need for somebody who's more strategy focused. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You begin to understand the need to have a larger technical team because you can't know everything. Mm-hmm. Who's going to support the product? Who is, you know, if you create a services company, who's mm-hmm. going to sell your services? 
who is going to manage the project mm -hmm. if it's more than just you? Mm -hmm. Who's going to interface with the customer when they don't pay their bills? Mm -hmm. And all of these little things mm -hmm. go into running a business. And when you start getting your first customers, all of a sudden you realize you need contracts. All of a sudden you realize, you know, and there are all of these pieces. And so starting a business is really about getting that first customer. Mm -hmm. you, create, you, you know, you put the shingle out and say, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. It's everything after that and up and until your first customer. Once you get that first customer, you have a lot better understanding of what it's going to take to run the business. And so what it really takes to run a business is to get your first customer. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed actually listening to you and uh, hope audience is also going to enjoy it. I would just tell audience a couple more things uh, from this episode is that uh, he himself, Wien himself gone through like ups and downs in his professional career. But if you see his career journey, how he handled his failure, how he managed to get back and, you know, uh, establish himself as the one of the influencers now in the data science community. So this is truly inspiring for all of us and hope you will enjoy this episode as well. And as I always say, until we meet, happy leading. Let's lead together. Stay safe. Bye for now. Thank you.